the first general issue is the competition between economic and cultural systems. And I'll show what that means in a minute or two. Secondly, how do you deal with a pariah state? Do you embrace it or do you isolate it? And this is a fundamental problem uh, that the West has had uh, for many years. Um, thirdly, what is the attitude in a small state if its government tries to appease the uh, uh, assertions of a major power? Fourthly, what are the dangers of a, a major power being dragged into a conflict uh, by its small power allies? And fifthly, and finally, I'll just say a word about institutions uh, that I won't put out pro-EU propaganda, as some of us are inclined to do. Um, <laughs> Okay, let me begin by an assertion. East Asia has been by far the most successful region in the world since the Second World War in economic and sometimes political development. Its success would have astonished most commentators writing in 1945. Yet at its heart, there is what can only be called a failed, or some would say, a rogue state, North Korea, or to give it its official title, the People's Democratic Republic of Korea. North Korea is surrounded by China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, all of whom have immensely impressive economic records, and Japan, South Korea or the Republic of Korea and Taiwan have all made this transition to stable democracy from autocracy, not something which is easy to do. At the end of the Second World War, it was as if some outside power had decided to set up a series of cultural, economic and political competitions competitions between neighboring pairs of rival states. North versus South Korea, Taiwan versus China, Japan versus China, and East versus West Germany, and India versus Pakistan, to name but a few. In the first four cases, of course, it was a competition between communism, or whatever you want to call it, socialism, and capitalism. And many, even in the West, thought that socialism was likely to emerge the winner. I mentioned, for example, E. H. Carr of our university, who suggested in a book published in 1942 that both small states and democratic capitalism were out of date. The two, why did he think this sort of thing? Well, the two apparently most successful economic units in 1945 were the United States and Soviet Union. So the assumption, the prejudice, if you like, was that uh, small states couldn't thrive. Where he was wrong, of course, was he, what he didn't know at that stage that the United States was to insist on a free trading or semi-free trading world system. And in such uh, a free trading system, of course, places like Singapore and Dubai can thrive and indeed are often easier to govern than these huge states like the Soviet Union. In concrete terms, he, they, people thought in this sort of way uh, that the Soviet Union had industrialized immensely rapidly in the 1920s and 1930s and that was what enabled its armed forces to, head, to tear the heart out of the German armed forces in the Second World War. It was the T-32 tanks rolling off the production line in huge quantities which made the difference on the Eastern Front. 
Okay, let me look at this competition and let me begin with Japan. Because it was Japan which showed the way, uh, the path for the other states in Asia. Of course, Japan had an economic advantage over China, that it was rapidly expanding uh, its industry in the 1920s in, and 1930s, even if its GNP was still tiny in 1941 compared with the Americans. It had, uh, as far as manufacturing output was concerned, just less than 4% of world manufacturing output in 1938, compared with about 29% for the United States. So it was only a fraction, a seventh of uh, United States <coughs> manufacturing outfit, our output when uh, the Second World, when it uh, uh, went into the Second World War. Just 35 years later, despite the devastation of Japanese cities and the fact that it was starving at the end of the Second World War, and it was starving because the American submarines had completely destroyed the Japanese merchant fleet. There were about 100,000 uh, seamen in the Japanese merchant navy in uh, 1941. 120,000 of them died in the Second World War. In other words, they recruited extra people uh, and most of them were killed during the course of the fighting. So they were devastated uh, at the end of the war. But just uh, 30 odd years later, uh, the uh, uh, output for the United States was about 21% of a world industrial output, and Japan's was 9%. In other words, almost half uh, the size of American industrial output. This was an astonishing achievement with export-led growth and brilliant technology. So it challenged the United States in many areas. The Japanese culturally have an immense tendency to take pains over things and um, uh, to work immensely hard. If you go to uh, a Japanese palace and you look at the grounds, all of the gravel on all of the drives will be carefully raked so that it runs in lines in the same direction. It's a, a, a typical reflection of their cultural tradition, an immense capacity to take pains. So they were almost as large in uh, industrial terms by 1980, half, almost half as large uh, as the United States, and many forecast that 20 years after that, they would overtake the United States in terms of GDP by 2000. There were weakness, of course, in Japanese society. Japanese dem democracy after 1945, the po uh, politics, included some uh, condemned as war criminals and brought them back into the government. The same power, uh, same party held power for many decades and so on. But it was far more stable than many would have expected after the chaos in Japan in the 1930s. It was a modern state. China, by contrast, was to go through a whole series of convulsions. At great expense in manpower and finances, it took part, a major part, in the Korean War against the United Nations from 1950 to 1953. Even more exhausting was Mao's decision to try and industrialize it post haste in the 1950s in the so-called Great Leap Forward, which resulted in the deaths of over 40 million Chinese through starvation mostly. In the 1960s, Mao had a second go at causing chaos by what he called the Cultural Revolution, in which people were stirred up to attack other members uh, of uh, Chinese society. If you took uh, the universities and schools, an area dear to my own heart, the students were encouraged to rise up uh, against the uh, people like ourselves sitting here uh, on this side of the table and 
dutifully did so and uh, either tortured them to death or so uh, uh, made life so miserable that many, many of them committed suicide. It wasn't until Mao was safely dead and his wife and the gang of so-called Gang of Four had been dismissed that matters could change. By that time, they could see very well what had happened in Japan and that export-led growth and a freer, more capitalist economy was the only way ahead. And the rest, as they say, is history. With now, uh, China now, the second largest economy in the world, and threatening to overtake the United States. The two careers were different. This time it was the socialist state which started with the advantage in the bilateral competition. North Korea was industrialized by Japan before and during World War II, while the South was generally pastoral rural. Both countries were devastated by the Korean War between 1950 and 1953. If you go to Korea, you will find that all of the rare historical artifacts are numbered. So you'll get a, a plaque on, say, a, a bell, a temple bell, which saying something like uh, historical artifact number 242. And they do this because so few of them survived, survived the Korean War, and those which did survive were buried during the course of the fighting and were dug up afterwards. If you go to a palace in Seoul, uh, which appears to be ancient, in fact, it's a replica. Everything was completely devastated. Uh, Seoul itself was overrun three times during the course of the fighting by different armies. So it was a picture of utter devastation in both North and South. And in the 1950s and 1960s, it was unclear which, uh, whether the North or the South, would be uh, the most successful. They had similar GDPs, and each was recognized by a considerable number of foreign states. But in the 1970s and 1980s, the military government in control in South Korea decided to follow the Japanese pattern. More than anything else, because of the hostility towards Japan uh, uh, and that aftermath of colonialism, they wanted to shake their fist at the Japanese to rival them. The first time I ever went to South Korea, I got to the immigration authorities, and uh, in those days they looked very carefully at your, your papers, this was 1982, and the immigration officer said, uh, you teach in Cambridge, and I said I did, uh, do you have uh, Japanese and Koreans on your course? And I said, yes, indeed we did, as we did. And he said, Koreans work harder than Japanese. And I said, yes, of course they do. And he stamped my passport and I went through. And it was a very good introduction to the, uh, to the rivalry between the two countries. And of course today, South Korea is one of the major uh, industrial states of the world with one of the uh, largest uh, motor manufacturing, shipbuilding, steel and so on. It's an astonishing achievement for a state which was devastated in the way it was in uh, 1953. At that stage it was far, far poorer than somewhere like Kenya or what we used to call Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Uh, the position today is wholly different. In the 1940s and 1950s, South Korea was, of course, less democratic uh, uh, than the United States would have liked. Its ruler was Syngman Rhee, who was an authoritarian figure who crushed opposition until he was replaced by the army in a coup in 1960. And they followed a series of officer rulers. But it was they who began the industrialization of the country and eventually allowed Elect free elections to take place in 1997. And that brought to power uh, the leading opposition figure, 
who the South Korean intelligence services had tried from time to time uh, to murder and who had uh, they'd imprisoned uh, for long periods uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. This was Kim Dae-jung. And he'd been in our department for six months before he was elected president. And what did he spend his time in uh, Britain at that stage doing? Well, he spent his time on a series of visits to Germany. And he went to Germany because he wanted to see what the effects of uh, reunification of Germany were being, were. Let me explain. Uh, in the 1980s, when I first went to South Korea, there was a Ministry of Korean Unification. And all Koreans professed to want North Korea to collapse immediately and for the two parts of it to be reunited. This was hardly surprising since many of them had uh, relatives cut off in the north. It was a savage war and left a savage legacy. What DJ Kim Dae-jung saw was that if that happened, it was going to be economically ruinous for South Korea. They were going to have an immense burden to bear for the next 20 or 30 years. He could see what was happening in uh, East and West Germany, the burden that East Germany represented, uh, and North Korea was going to be a much, much greater burden than uh, 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 East Germany was for the West. So what was his policy? His policy was what he called the sunshine policy. He developed it in Cambridge, effectively. And this was that you should gradually integrate uh, North Korea. You shouldn't try to destroy the North Korean government at one blow. You should integrate it gradually by uh, helping it industrialize, helping tourists go to the north, and that this would also act as a confidence building measure between North and South. So they set up an industrial uh, zone in the North. They tried to encourage tourism between the two parts and so on. Um, and I'll talk in a minute or two about the fate of the Sunshine Policy. In contrast, in North Korea, what you had and have is effectively uh, a hereditary dictatorship, beginning with Kim Il-sung immediately after the Second World War. And we're now on Kim the Third, in a sense. Um, it, it's hereditary in, in a traditional uh, Asian sense. Many people call North Korea a, uh, a pariah state. Uh, why? Well, because uh, right through the period of uh, South Korea's success, it has carried out a rather extraordinary series of terrorist incidents, acts of one sort or another. In the I can't go into all of these, obviously, but in the 1970s, to take a, a random example, a whole series of enormous tunnels were discovered uh, running from their side of the border uh, to uh, the South Korean side. Uh, these were dug, they were often about a mile long, and they were supposed to be able to carry a jeep through from North to South Korea. So they're fairly big, and you can visit them if you go to South Korea. Uh, they give you a hard hat in case you bang your head on the roof, um, and uh, you can go into one of them at least uh, and see what the North Koreans had been up to. And they were hoping to infiltrate uh, uh, terror, what, what we would call terrorists, they would call guerrillas, uh, through into the South to stage events of one sort or another, and perhaps even a more major attack. On one occasion, my wife and I were invited up to a um, national park area uh, on the coast, right up against the North Korean border, in the German border, uh, in, in, in the Korean border. And it was fascinating to be there. It was a beautiful area with enormous snow-covered mountains and a uh, lovely seascape and a wonderful golden beach. But uh, at night, everybody was banned, every normal person was banned from the beach area. And at night, the, the South Korean soldiers would dig themselves holes in the beach 
and place their machine guns, one sort or another. Others would go around the beach raking it that so that if infiltrators came in over the beach um, during the night, they would know about it in the morning. And by looking at, the, uh, looking at these South Korean soldiers, I was pretty certain I wouldn't want to chance it. Uh, a few more of the uh, incidents, and one of the major ones, 1983, the entire South Korean cabinet was on a vi visit to Rangoon, and it was blown up by two North Korean terrorists. Uh, four cabinet ministers and 13 other South Koreans were killed. The two North Korean agents typically were captured uh, without much difficulty. In November 1987, a South Korean airliner flying from Baghdad to Seoul was blown up by two North Korean agents. They placed the bomb on the airliner and then got off the airliner. Uh, they were, however, uh, easily enough captured where they got off the air after the airliner had blown up. Um, and uh, the man committed suicide. The woman, however, was uh, captured and taken back to Seoul and imprisoned. So, but there was no doubt about who had done this and why they'd done it. It was to try to disrupt communications with Seoul and uh, certainly to discourage people from visiting the Seoul Olympics. So many, many of these other terrorist incidents, too many to mention. But let me just mention one peculiarity. Uh, on the 17th of September 2002, the North Korean dictator uh, at, at that stage, Kim Jong-il, uh, made an astonishing confession. He confessed that they had uh, captured, kidnapped, a, a number of Japanese off the beaches um, in Japan. These included a beautician, two school children, uh, and other uh, quite not quite ordinary people. And you might say, why on earth have they gone about capturing such people? Communist states often have um, uh, kidnapped people in the past during the Cold War years, but these have usually been uh, obvious rebels uh, against a particular communist state. This was capturing perfectly ordinary but young people. Why? because apparently they wanted to turn them into terrorists, uh, to brainwash them and so on. These people had just simply disappeared uh, in uh, Japan. And uh, there were rumors had gone around that it was something to do with the North Koreans, but it seemed almost unbelievable. It, would have, it, would have, it, it was a story that would appeal to conspiracy theorists of one sort or another, but usually it wouldn't turn out to be right. Well, it was right in this case. And in as 2002, as I say, uh, the North Korean uh, leader made a confession. And it's rather interesting because it's a perfect confession, uh, a perfect apology in the sense that I was talking about yesterday. He'd obviously, all his officials have been looking at Western apologies of one sort or another, and it was modeled on what it, we say is the right way to do it. Let me, let me quote. The special forces, that's North Korean special forces, were carried away by a reckless quest for glory. It was regretful, and I want frankly to apologize. I've taken steps to ensure that it can never happen again. It was a fulsome apology, and must have been very difficult for a North Korean uh, leader, because after all, there's this tremendous rivalry with Japan, and the apology was to Japan, and it was a, a confession of failure. What was the Japanese reaction? Well, I'm afraid it, it didn't turn out to be a confidence-building measure of the type I was suggesting yesterday. Uh, for one thing, it confirmed these conspiratorial rumors that had been going around. <laughs> Secondly, it seemed so bizarre. And thirdly, unfortunately, most of these, or many of these poor wretches uh, who'd been kidnapped to North Korea had died. And so it did nothing, just the opposite, to improve Japanese North Korean relations. Other events, however, 
uh, show a North Korean leaders uh, to be very clever. How, if you're a backward, incompetent, semi-starving nation, can you attract the attention of people in Washington and Beijing? Well, the answer is straightforward. You concentrate all your scientists that you have uh, in making nuclear weapons, and as we've recently been reminded, uh, missile systems uh, that might potentially carry these nuclear weapons. Remember, North Korea is uh, uh, today, or was at least a few years ago anyway, and may not have changed, a country without a working X-ray machine. There are no X-ray machines in North Korea. When a, a, a brewer of beer from Britain was invited to Pyongyang to go and set up a brewery, he found grave difficulty, first of all, in being allowed to test the water in Pyongyang, and then in setting up the brewery, because the water that people habitually drink in Pyongyang is infected with, well, <laughs> No bones about it, sewage. Um, it's uh, uh, filthy water uh, of one sort or another. A Swedish truck uh, manufacturer, I can't remember, Saab or Volvo, was invited to North Korea to set up a truck plant, but he found that the bridges in North Korea were generally far too weak to carry a, a modern lorry or truck, whatever you want to call it. It's a very, very backward state in every respect. But as I say, it uh, uh, focuses the attention, as it's just doing at the moment, on people in high places around the world. Now, of course, uh, I, I said that Kim Dae-jung uh, wanted to integrate this state uh, gradually into the world system. This. I'm afraid failed. It failed for various reasons. I won't go into all the detail at this stage. One was that a, a South Korean tourist was shot dead on a visit to North Korea. But the, uh, in one way, one of the most crucial changes was that the uh, election of George Bush's uh, administration in the United States, because Bush wanted to reverse that policy. He, as he says clearly in his memoirs, wanted to overthrow the, uh, uh, the North Korean leaders as rapidly as possible. He regarded it, regards it as a revolting state, horrible state, which indeed it is, um, but uh, it's very difficult with virtually no trade with North Korea to bring any pressure to bear on it from the West. Uh, we've been thinking uh, about it over again just at the moment, but the only things that North Korea exports are drugs, and I'm afraid many of its diplomats carry smuggled drugs uh, to the rest of the world and weaponry of one sort or another. And none of that weaponry, of course, is uh, uh, imported to the West. It has a huge army of uh, over a million men, plus 5.7 million paramilitary troops in reserve. But Jim Hall, uh, a colleague of mine who was the first British um, official diplomat in Pyongyang reckons that he never saw this army carrying out manoeuvres. Most of its time, as far as he could see, it, it spent um, uh, 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 helping with the harvest and uh, digging in the rice fields and that sort of thing. I think if it came to a conventional war, the South Korean army with the US backing would go uh, through the North Korean forces like a knife through butter. I mean, it would be a very one-sided conflict. Um, and that again, excuse me, <coughs> is another reason why, of course, um, uh, North Korea wants nuclear weapons. Now a few words on Taiwan or the Republic of China. And as I've said on another occasion, Taiwan physically is a state. There's absolutely no question it's stable, it's very well organized, it's a thriving democracy, economically it's successful, and so on. Uh, but it's only recognized by a handful of countries around the world. 
Uh, I did meet on one occasion, uh, he came to Cambridge to give a lecture for us in our department, the man who's been in recent years the president of uh, Taiwan. He was uh, uh, Ma, uh, he had uh, uh, been a banker in the United States for many years, he was familiar with the US system, uh, he'd also studied over in the United States, he'd written a, uh, a thesis on the uh, dispute between China and Japan over islands uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the area. Um, he seemed struck me on that occasion as to be very level-headed. His policy uh, while in office has been to reverse some of the policies of the opposition DPP. When the DPP was in power in Taiwan before Mao was elected, um, it followed a much more nationalist agenda. It was um, uh, uh, a confounded nuisance, actually, to both Washington and Beijing, to put it mildly. Um, what is the, uh, what's the objective of China and the United States as far as the, the situation there is concerned? Well, of course, more than anything else, they want stability. And I have absolutely no doubt that when the previous DPP uh, government was in office, the American representative in Taiwan went frequently uh, into the government offices there and banged the table and told them and warned them that the United States would not necessarily come into a conflict if the DPP uh, declared independence from China. Now, I think the Chinese government is extremely foolish to have said that if uh, Taiwan declares independence, it will go to war. I think it's foolish because no other country is going to recognize Taiwan as independent if it did make such a declaration. Quite frankly, uh, the interests of a country like yours or ours um, is uh, uh, with developing relations with the mainland, with China. We're certainly not going to go out of our way to recognize Taiwan. So there was absolutely no need for the Beijing to say that it would go to war. But what they tell you now is that having made that commitment, it would be impossible for the present government in China uh, to survive in the face of public opinion um, if they were to allow uh, Taiwan to become independent. They've over the years made uh, uh, threats that they might invade Taiwan uh, in those circumstances. I think it's unlikely that they would succeed in doing so, more particularly, of course, if the United States came in to support Taiwan. And uh, they show signs of appreciating that. What they've done is to produce a huge number of missiles which, uh, they, uh, with which they could, in those circumstances, bomb, bombard Taiwan and wreak havoc in Taipei, the capital, and elsewhere in Taiwan. So, what the Americans are trying to do is to say uh, to the Taiwanese, don't push your luck, don't uh, declare independence, um, uh, we, you, you can't be certain that we would come into a conflict uh, with China if you get into those uh, circumstances. But at the same time, they have to warn the Chinese that uh, they might come into a conflict and support uh, Taiwan. This is an extremely difficult balancing act to do. And unfortunately, historically, there have been plenty of cases where the small state has uh, decided to risk it and uh, the uh, large state hasn't been convinced that uh, the guarantor will come into the conflict. So what's happened recently? Well, the Kuomintang in the recent elections has been voted out, and the photogenic Ms. Tsai, if I've got the pronunciation right, which I'm sure I haven't, has been re-elected as the leader of the DPP. Well, uh, immediately the Chinese have gone on warning 
the um, uh, uh, Taiwanese at the dangers of pushing their luck, uh, and no doubt the Americans uh, are saying exactly the same thing. One of the great problems is that the uh, public on both sides of the strait uh, are becoming more nationalistic. A few years ago, uh, because they knew some members of the leaders of the uh, Kuomintang in Taiwan, uh, I was invited to Xiamen in China uh, to give a lecture on cross-straits relations. Xiamen is, is a strange place. It's a wonderful example of the industrial success of China uh, in recent years. You can drive for miles and find one international company like uh, Kodak after another uh, the factories that they've set up in Xiamen. It's very close to an island which has been uh, controlled by Taiwan ever since the Second World War. Uh, you can actually, uh, you could fire a rifle uh, across the straits there between Taiwan and the mainland. They have big placards on the beach on both sides uh, um, with insults to the other side. I can't read Chinese, so I didn't know uh, in the period when I was there um, what the insults of the day were, but uh, each day you change the insult for the, for the other side. You know, capitalists running dogs and hyenas or whatever it is they're saying, or whatever the jargon is at the moment. Um, anyway, I gave this lecture at the uh, at, uh, University in Sharman, um, uh, and the bur whole burden of the lecture was uh, play, play the conflict down, try to abate uh, the conflict. Uh, the Kuomintang is committed to good relations across, across the Straits. The first question that I had from the uh, assembled students um, was, um, if we liberate Taiwan, will the Americans come into the conflict? And the second question, I took them both together, was if, the, if we liberate Taiwan, no, the vocabulary being used, if we liberate Taiwan <coughs> and use nuclear weapons in the process, will the Americans use nuclear weapons? And I put my head in my hands and said, I've just been trying to persuade you for the last hour um, uh, uh, to, to calm down and uh, play, the, play the, the relationship long. Well, so, uh, but it did reflect uh, the, uh, the nationalism there and the vice chancellor of the university got up when I finished and he said, well remember all of you, and said this in English so I would, um, I, I would understand it, um, uh, Taiwan is part of China and always will be. So uh, it wasn't only coming up from the students below, it was coming down uh, from, the, from the mainland from the, the government. Younger generations everywhere are more idealistic, but uh, as we know from opinion polls, also most more risk-taking. And across the world they're becoming, and certainly in eight parts of Asia, they're becoming more nationalistic. Uh, not least because, as I said the other day, of what they see of what they see as the humiliation of their country in the past. They have a strong culture of victimization in China, and the government has deliberately stirred that up over the last 20 years, but it's uh, running away from them, uh, and they can't easily control it. So as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, I want you to think about how a great power like the United States can, in a way, deal with uh, a smaller power uh, like Taiwan without becoming inveigled into a conflict. I want you to think about how one should deal with a pariah state like North Korea. Is it better to follow Kim Dae-jung's policy and embrace it? Or should you uh, embargo it, isolate it, and try to bring down the government? Thank you very much.